Hi, everyone. Welcome to the special edition of the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. Today, we have PhD student Neil Patel, who is going to be uh, presenting his dissertation work. And I'm Neil's co-advisor, Scott Clemmer. And this is Tap Parikh, who's Neil's other co-advisor. And advising Neil has just been an amazing experience for me. Even before Neil started at Stanford, he came to me and said, uh, I would really like to do research that has social impact in the developing world. Uh, would you be willing to sign on and advise me on, on this kind of research? And I said, sure, why not? But you're really going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting as this is outside my research area. And Neil has charted an incredible path for himself. Most years, he spent half his time living and doing field work in Gujarat, India, and half of his time in the Bay Area. And the, the dedication that he's shown has been remarkable. I think another amazing feature of Neil's dissertation work that you'll see in the hour, in the coming hour, is the strength of Neil's work as both systems research, imagining new kinds of systems for new kinds of contexts, and uh, also as deployment work, people are really using this to get real things done. Here are the people that you're working with are not 18-year-olds uh, that you've paid $5 to come into the lab and do a 20-minute experiment, but farmers whose livelihood depends on the farming knowledge and other pieces of information that they're gaining through these systems. And yet, at the same time, Neil has done this really wonderful cross-cultural experimental work testing many of the theories that we have about how social groups form and about how people interact in places like the Bay Area and seeing the ways in which that carries across to these new contexts and the ways in which are the assumptions that we've made living in Palo Alto are violated when you fly halfway around the world. And so uh, I look forward to hearing Neil's talk. Thanks, Scott, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my work on the design and usage of voice-based social media for remote rural communities. In the coming years, more and more of the world's population will be going online. Most of the new users will be in cultural, social, and economic contexts different from the one for which internet technologies were originally developed. So the next three billion online users will look less like this and more like this. Many will be from poor marginal communities in rural areas around the world. To enable any new technology in these communities, it must be appropriate to their unique context. Agriculture is the principal source of livelihood for the world's poor. Over 80% of the labor force in the world's low-income countries depends on agriculture. In India alone, there are 600 million people who are agrarian. The majority of Indian farmers are small-scale, and each growing season take on substantial debt in hopes of a successful harvest. However, with rising costs and stagnating productivity, farmers are under intense pressure to make ends meet every season. Improving livelihoods of farmers partly lies in equipping them with relevant and timely agricultural information for good decision making. So many governments, including the government of India, invest heavily in what's known as agricultural extension, which is basically adult education for farmers. It's a massive program in India, though it still struggles to, meet, to reach everybody. So a survey conducted by the International Food Policy Research Institute found that only 6% of Indian farmers reported actually having interacted with an extension officer. This statistic highlights the challenges to this top-down model of agricultural extension. First, it's not comprehensive. An extension officer coming to your location may not have the specific knowledge required to help with your particular problems. And second, it's not on demand. So oftentimes a farmer needs help right away. He can't wait for an extension officer to come around to his location. Many grassroots organizations working in, in, in rural areas around the world are trying to address these limitations. One such organization is Development Support Center, which is uh, based in Gujarat, India. Over the past several years, DSE has been producing a weekly radio program, which reaches hundreds of thousands of farmers throughout the state. Radio remains an effective medium for localized communication for rural communities, and DSE has been using it to great effect for delivering relevant, timely agricultural advice. However, radio is still mostly a one-way communication. 
it's not easy for listeners to discuss the content, share their experiences, or ask follow-up questions once the program goes off the air. In short, radio does not fully tap a significant latent resource in rural communities, which are the farmers themselves. Working in rural areas over the past few years, I've been really struck by the ingenuity of farmers in finding solutions to common problems faced in their local context. Local knowledge from a progressive farmer like this one shown here is contextually appropriate for others in his community. So we envisioned a platform that would complement radio to create a more two-way interactive communication channel. We wanted this platform to support many-to-many -many communication and it would be a way for people to give their voice and share what they know. Now to make this vision a reality, we proposed voice as the platform uh, as the platform's content medium. Now why voice? There are several reasons. First, voice content can be accessed and authored using low-cost mobile phones which have achieved remarkable penetration in developing regions around the world. Phones also work in environments with intermittent, intermittent power and connectivity. Also, a, also voice as a medium for content access and creation is suitable for low literate or illiterate users. Previous research has shown that for people in developing regions, voice is, a preferred, is preferred to text-based interaction, the main reason being the difficulty in reading and to some extent composing text. <coughs> and finally, a critical aspect of our vision is to support farmers in participating directly in the knowledge creation process. So voice provides the lowest barrier to entry for content creation. It doesn't require any specialized knowledge. All you have to know how to do is speak into a phone. So this research introduces voice-based social media for rural communities. Our work has been guided by three research questions. First, how should we design voice UIs for navigating lots of audio content suitable for inexperienced technology users? Second, what happens when these systems are put out in the real world uh, in scenarios with real people depending on them? What types of social dynamics emerge and how does that inform design? And finally, how can the system's functionality and associated processes support sustained interest and engagement in the system? So my talk today will present research in the form of a field study and controlled experiments around these three questions. And to help keep track of where we are, there's three breadcrumbs corresponding to the three questions that will be on the top left corner of the screen. As a probe for this research, in collaboration with Development Support Center and others, we designed, implemented, and deployed Avaj Ortlo, which means uh, voice stoop. It's a voice-based forum or message board for mostly technology novice users to access and share agricultural in information using mobile phones. So the system is set up as an interactive voice response or IVR system in Gujarati, which is the official language of the state where DSE is based. So people dial a regular number using any phone and navigate audio prompts to access one of several features. Any one of several features. And one of those features is a question and answer forum, which allows people to post questions, listen to questions and answers of other farmers, and respond to questions themselves. Now to give you a feel for the interaction, I'll now play a sample dialogue from the system. As you hear the actual Gujarati prompts, the corresponding English translations will show up on the screen. जो तुम्हारे प्रश्न नोंदा वो होए तो बोलो नोंद जो बीजा खेडूत मित्रों है पूछेला सवाल जवाब सांभर वा होए तो बोलो सवाल सवाल हवे तमे चिल्ला पांच सवाल अने तैमना आवेला जवाब सांभर शो पहला सवाल सांभरा वो शो So getting back to our guiding research questions, I'll begin by talking about our work on Avadrotlo's usability. 
During the system's design phase, we conducted field interviews and tested low fidelity prototypes of voice UIs. One thing that these early tests demonstrated was the difficulty in responding to colloquial open-ended prompting. So instead of a prompt saying something like, would you like to ask a question, listen to announcements, or listen to the radio program, we found explicit prompting much more effective. To ask a question, say question. To listen to announcements, say announcements. So this finding led us to choose to use explicit prompting in Avadrotlo. But given this decision, we had some options in terms of the input modality. One was to collect a few hours of Gujarati speech training data from 20 to 50 people, hand transcribe it, and either train or adapt an acoustic model to create a limited vocabulary, isolated word speech recognizer. On the other hand, researchers have shown that for low perplexity navigation tasks in voice UIs, touch tone input can be both more effective uh, in completing tasks and preferred to isolated word speech interfaces. So we conducted an experiment to test these two modalities. We ran a control experiment with 45 participants. <laughs> we separated them into two treatment groups, speech input and touch tone input, and had them complete some tasks involving navigation and simple data entry. All participants were farmers by profession and ranged in age from their early 20s to their late 50s. None of the study participants had any prior experience with voice interfaces, and the majority of participants had less than an eighth grade education and reported never having used a PC. So for all the studies that I'll be presenting today, the participants fit this standard demographic profile. In our experiment, each participant completed three tasks which varied in the number of navigational steps. For, each, for the speech recognition, we used IBM's Genesis speech engine, which is a system trained on American English. We use a cross-language transfer method to adapt the recognizer to Gujarati, which involves using an unmodified acoustic model in one language, in this case, English, and applying it to a transliter transliterated vocabulary in the target language, which is, in, in this case, with Gujarati. For the study, this approach uh, achieved an accuracy of 94% compared to 98% for many commercial systems. We tested 38 of the participants in a calm, quiet office. The remaining seven were tested in a quiet room in their villages due to their traveling constraints. The quiet settings weren't the most realistic environments for this system, but for a fair comparison, we wanted to test both modalities under optimal conditions. Our main finding was that overall task completion rate with touch tone was significantly higher compared to speech, 74% versus 61%. User preference was comparable between the two. The study provided a few explanations for why speech was less effective. First, a majority of speech users expressed awkwardness when speaking single word commands. It was just perceived as unnatural. Many users could not avoid speaking in full sentences. The second reason for speech's underperformance was difficulty in recovering from errors made either by the user or the speech recognizer. So in the speech treatment, the task completion rate dropped significantly when one or more of these errors occurred. And finally, this experiment tested simple tasks with low perplexity. Touchdown can provide a lower goal of execution for such tasks, but for more complex tasks, tasks such as search, speech may be more amenable. This experiment provided a concrete design insight, the efficacy of touchtone input. And it also demonstrated the system's usefulness enough for us to want to take it out of the lab and into the real world. So in January 2009, we launched a pilot of Avaj Otlo. Broadly, the goals of the pilot were to see what happens when the service was being used by farmers seeking agricultural information in their day-to-day -day lives, to observe usage and feedback that would inspire future design and research, and to give DSE, our partner organization, experience administering such a system. The pilot participants were 63 males. Most were educated formally up to high school with no significant experience with computers. To encourage maximal usage of the system, it was available through a toll-free number. So participants could call, the, could call the system and use it as much as they liked, as long as they wanted, without charge. The pilot system had three features inspired by our earlier field work and conversations with DSC. 
The first is an announcements board to listen to headlines that DSC would upload to the system regularly. The second feature is an archive to listen to previously broadcast episodes of DSC's radio program. And finally, there is a forum for farmers to ask, answer, and browse agriculture-related questions and answers. In terms of this forum's format, the most recently posted question would, appear, would be listened to first, as in a last-in, first-out queue. Also, we cap the number of answers to any question to two. So as you browse the forum, you would hear a question, then between zero and two answers, depending on how many had been recorded, then the next question, and so on. Here's a graph showing calls to the system over the seven-month pilot period. There were about 7,000 calls made to the system in all, and the average call duration was about five minutes. There was a novelty effect for the first month but subsequently, the call traffic reached a steady state. For the pilot deployment, we gave callers a choice to navigate the system through either voice or touch tone. So uh, the prompting was slightly modified from what you had heard in the earlier demo. The prompting said to listen to a question, say question, or press 1. To listen to announcements, say announcements, or press 2. 91% of the calls chose to use touchstone for navigation. So this result provided some ecological validity to our earlier lab study. Although most of the participants called the system at least once, a minority of people accounted for most of the calls. This graph shows calls by caller on a log scale. When we looked at who the most frequent callers were, we found some common characteristics. The three most active callers were less educated, geographically remote, young, and in general just seem to be more progressive and welcoming to new technology. The question and answer forum was the most popular feature of the system, both in terms of number of accesses and based on our interviews. In total, there were 610 questions and 286 <laughs> responses recorded. Of the responses, 43% came from farmers and the remainder came from DSC staff who also monitored the forum regularly and gave responses as necessary. As is the case on internet-based discussion lists, the majority of traffic on the forum was lurking traffic, meaning people would listen in without posting any content. In terms of the answers of those that came from the farmers, the majority of them came from the generally most active users. So this contrasts many question and answer sites online where there is often a distinct group of askers and answerers. <clears throat> the most common type of question posted to the forum asks for prescriptive advice on how to deal with a pest or disease. So for example, what pesticide should be sprayed to control black sucking pests? <laughs> And a typical response suggests some possible solutions. Besides question and answer, the forum was host to a variety of other types of content. For example, some posts weren't questions at all, but more like updates or experience sharing. So in this example, a farmer is suggesting a solution to a commonly encountered pro problem in his area, adding that the solution has been proven through their own local experimentation. Notably, people also used the forum for entertainment. From very early on in the pilot, farmers were recording songs and jokes on the forum. <laughs> Another use case of the system was farmers using the streamed audio content as sort of like an iPod. So one reported how he would call into the system to listen to the radio program to help him stay awake at night as he protected his fields from wild animal attacks. Other farmers used the call recording facility on their phones to download content from the system or as this farmer is doing, recording off another phone that was playing content from the system. So they would then listen to that locally stored content later or distribute it to others. There were, several, there were several reoccurring social behaviors and community dynamics during the pilot. First, it was common in message recordings for farmers to begin by stating their name and location. Namaste, sir. 
રાજકોટ જિલ્લાના વાંગત જસદણ તાલુકાના વાંગતરા ગામથી કેરાળિયા બાબુભાઈ અર્જનભાઈ બોલું છું મારો મોબાઈલ નંબર છે અઠ્ઠાણું બસો પિસ્તાલીસ Now this was particularly noteworthy because for the sake of brevity the system restricted recording time to 30 seconds so a significant proportion of the time was used just to introduce oneself Another common occurrence was moderation which people pitched in to do from early on in the pilot So here a user is advising others against posting songs or jokes uh suggesting instead to stick to farming related questions And later another farmer took a much more impassioned tone when moderating for spurious content threatening the offender that would be kicked off So introducing oneself was a norm established to deal with communicating in the system and moderation by the user community was an indication that users felt a sense of ownership over the virtual space Both social phenomena are what Ackerman and others have noted as signs that the system supported an active social space. And this is remarkable given the minimal capability and functionality of the voice message board itself. Another dynamic we observed was intermediated access. So here a farmer asked for advice on a question that several farmers in his village were interested in. Another participant reported going out of his way to purchase speakers that he could connect to his phone so that he could play messages on the system for groups of friends and family that would come visit him. So one third of those that we interviewed reported functioning as information gateways. And finally, during the pilot we noted the significant in, uh, role uh, that social status played uh, in communication within the system. For some people the voice forum represented a platform to establish or enhance their social standing. So in this quote a farmer tells how having access to the technology is a source of pride for him and his family it elevates his standing with others in the community Now the flip side to this is that those who have high social standing already established in their community may look upon the system as a threat to that standing so here a non-user of the system explains why he finds no benefit from it he considers himself to be a very experienced and knowledgeable person and since the system does not consider his outside reputation uh and differentiate his contribution in the system it does not have much value to him in fact outside reputation or perceived authority was an important marker for most participants when deciding what is useful or relevant information keep in mind that our original motivation for this system was to give farmers a voice in sharing knowledge amongst themselves now given that motivation We were struck that in interviews participants overwhelmingly said they preferred to receive receive answers from the nominal authorities as compared to their peers. So we asked participants who they preferred receiving answers from, DSE, which is the NGO, farmers or both, and 65% replied that they wanted answers exclusively from DSE. 35% said from both DSE and farmers and none said from just farmers. Now what's behind the sentiment? As this quote indicates, farmers may prefer authorities because they perceive them to have greater depth or breadth of knowledge or that scientific evidence-based information is more appropriate than farmers' more experiential knowledge. Now, although this opinion is totally reasonable, we wondered how much of it was based on impartial judgment of information and how much of it had to do with a non-discriminating deference to authorities. Now we know that authority is a powerful influencer across many societies but researchers have noted how especially important social hierarchy is in Indian society. In a recent study by Savani and his colleagues, uh urbanite Indians were primed with expectations of authority figures or peers then given decision making tasks. The researchers found that subjects adjusted their choices in deference to the authorities but not to the peers. and they didn't find the deferential effect when they ran the same study with comparable american subjects so clearly there are differences between cultural environments that lead to differences in people's thinking and behaviors social software is best at supporting social interaction when it accounts for the key differences so for example if rural indians are categorically more persuaded by information coming from nominal authorities uh it changes how we design and even conceptualize social software for that community 
So with this motivation, we ran an experiment to test for a deferential tendency among Avaj Odlu users. Our research, our research question asked whether presenting the same information, the same information would be more influential if it came from a nominal authority versus a peer. We hypothesized that farmers are more influenced by information from the nominal authorities compared to peers based on the feedback that, they, that we had gathered from interviews. To measure how, influen how influenced partner, uh, participants were, we wanted a strong indicator. So we chose to use a behavioral measure. Upon hearing an informational tip over the phone, would the farmer call back to get further information on the tip? So to test the hypothesis, we first developed some content. We had DSC generate seven agricultural tips. So here's one of the tips we used on dealing with root rot in cotton. The tips have to be factually accurate practical and relevant to a wide audience, and the language had to be plausible coming from either an authority or a farmer. So we had the same set of tips recorded by two scientists from local reputed agricultural universities and two farmers from different districts in the state. We used two of each to mitigate the effect of potential persuasiveness differences between individual voices. Now in practice, we know that farmers and scientists can both provide valuable advice in different situations. The question isn't whether one source or the other provides better advice, but whether people treat information differently from the different sources. Understanding the psychology behind the persuasiveness of information can aid in designing online systems. If authorities are found to be more influential than peers, we could use that knowledge in designing a reputation system uh, for the online community where, for example, part of a farmer's reputation could come through endorsement or recognition from the authorities. For the experiment, we delivered tips to subjects every other day over the course of 14 days. Each participant received tips through an incoming call from our server. When a participant picked up the phone, he was greeted by a recorded voice that introduced the tip. Then the tip was played in either the voice of a scientist or a farmer. This was a within-subject study, so subjects heard tips from both farmers and scientists. The tipster began by introducing themselves by giving their name and affiliation if they were the scientist or their village name if they were the farmer. The tipster then introduced a general topic or problem to be discussed, but stopped short of providing information on how to actually act upon or use the information. He informs that to hear the complete tip, the caller should hang up the phone, and dial another number, uh, the one that follows. If the farmer did choose to follow up, he called the number, received the greeting, and then heard the entirety of the tip from the same voice that gave the tip's introduction. Over the course of the experiment, uh, 1,883 calls were attempted for seven unique tips. Of the calls that were attempted, about 70% were actually picked up. And of those that were picked up, 125 led to farmers making a follow-up call. When we compared the follow-ups by tip source, we found that opposite to our hypothesis, there were more follow-ups to tips given by the peer farmers compared to the scientists. So farmers who in previous surveys had expressed their preference for information from nominal authorities actually acted upon information more when it came from a peer farmer. So this result is among the first empirical data to back anecdotal findings from others and our own experience that peer networks are relatively effective for information dissemination in rural communities. It also supports the Government of India's National Sample Survey that was conducted in 2005, which showed that the number one source of information uh, and practices was other progressive farmers. However, this result does raise the question of whether deferential behavior previously demonstrated in lab settings in India varies among different social strata in India and in different decision-making scenarios. And we leave those questions for future work. Now one notable point about this result is that the behavior of farmers conflicted with what they said. Remember that we were originally interested in conducting this study because farmers stated a strong preference for information coming from the nominal authorities. And even after the experiment, when we again asked farmers the general sentiment had not changed. We interviewed 34 participants from the study and found that 42% stated a preference for scientists provided information and 19% preferred peers. 
So why was there an inconsistency between farmers' stated preference and their actual behavior? Well, the social, scientist, social sciences offers two plausible explanations. First is a social desirability bias. Farmers may be answering according to what they believe is the right or favorable answer or that reflects most positively on themselves. So for example, in this quote, a farmer is explaining how in this day and age, it is more appropriate to seek information from the scientists. The other source of inconsistency between stated preference and behavior could be coming from our position as researchers. So farmers viewed us, the interviewers, as part of the institutions that they ascribed authority. So when we ask them whether they prefer authority or peer, they may be, uh, we may be getting an answer that farmers believe will be agreeable to us. To briefly recap, we launched the pilot version of Avadrotlo, observed some of the emergent phenomena in the system, and studied one particular dynamic in more depth. After the pilot, DSC wanted to continue Avadrotlo as an ongoing project under their management, so together we made arrangements to transition the system from proof of concept to a full featured service. This transition led us to think about Avadrotlo's viability in the long run. How would the system hold up as a service over the course of years? And what factors would come into play to keep people interested and engaged in the system? Now for the launch, we made several key changes and updates to the system. First, we made the line available to any caller, not just the 60 or so pilot participants. Next, we eliminated speech input completely from the voice interface, given its lack of use. Also, we developed a web-based interface for DSC to perform a number of administration tasks. Here's a screenshot of the administration interface. We chose to develop it as a web application because while end users of the system mostly have access to only phones, the administrators of the system, in this case DSC, have relatively reliable internet access. And even with intermittent power and connectivity, we could assume that administrators would be able to access the internet for an hour or so per day in their office to perform these routine administration tasks. So this interface looks similar to an email inbox, but instead of text messages, the inbox has, inbox has voice messages. Each voice message board or forum in the phone interface has a corresponding inbox for newly posted messages. The administrator begins by reviewing each message by listening to it. And then after listening, she can enter details about the message's author. A principle we stuck to for the administration interface was to always leave humans in the loop. So instead of relying on speech to text or other automated solutions, we assumed that humans would be performing the manual tasks. Along these lines, the interface also lets you categorize messages. So these tags can also then be used to create filtered lists in the phone interface. So all messages, for example, tagged with the topic government could be accessible as a sub-menu option from the main forum. After adding the metadata, the administrator decides whether or not to approve the message. Moderation capability was one of the first things DSC requested for the new system. It allowed them to more easily editorialize the forum and maintain a high level of quality for the content uh, that people would listen to. Over time, another feature that was added was the ability to route messages to particular responders. DSC identified a number of staff members and agricultural scientists as their designated network of question responders for Avadrotlo. So based on a question's topic, they can assign one or more responders to each question. Responders receive the message through an inbound call from the system at a time that they have pre-specified. They can then listen and record the response right over the phone. Now this routing mechanism was added to improve response time and make things more convenient for responders. Later we also added automatic routing of these responses back to the question asker. So if you asked a question, you got your answer back with a phone call as soon as it was available. Now say a response to a really common question comes in. So we've recently added the ability to take that or any uh, message in the system and turn it back around. <coughs> as a broadcast to any number of other recipients. In this way, a single response or other worthy content can conveniently be heard by a broader audience. Oh. 
that's not right. For that. All right. Okay. So this administration interface was a significant upgrade, making management of the system convenient for DSC. But the most impactful change since the pilot was something was something less uh, subtle, something more subtle. The phone number used to access the system during the pilot was a toll-free number. But primarily for budgetary reasons, DSC decided to make the system available over a regular local number for the full launch. In India, phone plans charge the person who initiates a call. So this change meant that farmers would be paying airtime charges to access a service instead of DSC subsidizing that call by paying for a toll-free line. Local call rates are between 30 to 60 pesa, depending on the call plan. So what this change meant was that farmers were now on the meter, paying one cent per minute to access the system. But pennies are a big deal for people earning $100 or less per month. So I'm going to show how this change affected usage of the system since the pilot. First, again, here is call, calling during the six-month pilot starting in January 2009. Keep in mind that at that time, the phone line was restricted to 63 farmers. Now, here's the call traffic to the system over the same time this year, 2011. The average number of calls per week dropped by almost two-thirds, and that's with about eight times as many individual farmers calling in during that time period. And callers were not just calling less. When they did call, people were listening for less time. So here's the average call duration between the toll-free and metered versions of the line. It dropped from five minutes to about two minutes. The decreased time per call has mostly come out of the time listening to other people's messages. So here we see that the lurking rate, or how much people browse the forum, was almost cut in half. So price-sensitive callers are directly asking their questions without browsing the forum to see if their question has already been asked and answered. So in choosing on one hand to spend a little bit of extra money to potentially get an immediate answer, and on the other hand to record, and, uh, record a question quickly and wait for a couple of days to get the answer back, many farmers are choosing to wait and save those precious few rupees. A consequence of less lurking is that social interaction in the forum has suffered. So whereas during the pilot, farmers accounted for about 43% of all the responses on the forum, peer responses have since dropped to nearly zero. So since the line has become metered, calling has down, gone down, but peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction has suffered greatly. So what should be done? Well, the naive solution is obvious. Make it cheaper or better yet free to call in. But again, the reality is that institutions such as DSE are constrained by tight and volatile budgets. So making the system completely free is an obvious answer, but it's not the most practical. So given a constrained budget, what's the best way to promote the system and also encourage pro-social behavior? We designed an experiment to answer that question. The goal was to compare different financial incentives to increase usage and interaction in the system. In marketing, a common promotional strategy is to offer freebies such as printers or razors to generate revenue from complementary products like ink cartridges or razor blades. So there is a large psychological difference between nearly free and free. By eliminating the is it worth it calculation completely, more people are willing to try a product out. So we compared the approach of giving away free calling to more judicious choices of freebies to specifically target pro-social behavior. We gave one group of participants free calls and another just the ability to record messages to the system for free. And then a third group was given free rating of messages where people could listen to and rate selected messages as a more lightweight way to contribute to the system. We hypothesized that while free calling would lead to more overall usage of the system, free recording would not only attract more usage but also contribution through the targeted promotion of message recording. To measure the effect of these interventions, we primarily relied on call data, how much people were calling in and for how long. We also looked at message posting levels, how much are people contributing actual content. And finally, we used interviews to help explain the quantitative findings. 
We gave uh, free access to subjects by sending out automated broadcast phone calls, just as in the previous experiment. And since participants were receiving the call instead of calling in, they effectively were given free access to the system. Participants were recruited by collecting phone numbers from previous months' system call logs. They were assigned to conditions randomly, but we also balanced for historical calling frequency. Participants would get a phone call uh, twice a week at about the same time each week. And here's how the calls worked. The call would first greet the subject and then play an informational message handpicked from the system. This message was content chosen by DSC to be spotlighted, such as an important announcement or common question and answer. The subject then got a 15 second motivational message encouraging the caller to call in, use Avadro Lomor, more, and post to the system. Then depending on the assigned condition, the caller would get an option to be connected directly to the system for a free session or to record a question, comment, or other feedback, or to rate the message they had just heard on a three-point scale. This table shows the data we collected over the course of the one month. In total, it was about uh, 3,000 broadcast calls, um, and they were picked up by 413 participants. The fourth column here labeled actions shows how many times a participant availed the free offer, whether it was navigating the system, through the free session, recording a message, or entering a rating. I want to thank my family. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So the results show that the time spent with the system varied significantly between conditions during the study period. So as we had predicted, those with access to the free calls spent much more time with the system. Some of these callers stretched their free session for over an hour, listening to dozens of messages at a time. It's noteworthy that when we take away the free airtime and look at just paid usage of the system, it decreased from historical levels. What this means is that the introduction of the regular broadcast calls led to a decrease in calls that participants made to the system at their own expense. In interviews, participants explained that the information that they were getting through the broadcast calls preempted the need to call in to the system for more information. The other point from this graph is that the number of paid calls did not vary between conditions during the study. So free calling as a freebie wasn't any more effective than the others in encouraging more frequent calling to the system. It just led to more time spent on each call, in particular the free calls. In terms of message posting, we found that participants in the free call and free recording conditions posted significantly more than those in the free rating condition. As we expected, ratings were the most frequent freebie taken, but that didn't translate to more participation in the forum. But perhaps most notably, the free calling participants did not post more than those in the free recording condition. So this means that free calling, the expensive, heavy-handed promotional approach, led to significantly more usage, but it did not lead to any more message contribution than the subjects who were given, just given the ability to record for free, which was the more judicious promotional approach. The lesson is that to encourage more usage of the system, nothing beats making it free. That's clear. But if the goal is to promote particular behaviors, such as contributing content, a more targeted approach can be more cost effective. So this result suggests follow-up work on using targeted financial rewards for certain behaviors. For example, we can try recording a question recording with a free call and answering a question with two free calls. Taking a step back out, I'd like to recap all the work that I presented today. HCI research is generally a study of people using systems in particular contexts. In this research, we started working to get the technology right. Of course, this involved understanding people, but we were primarily concerned with the mechanics of getting the system to work in this real world scenario. Next, we put the system out to see how it was used in the wild. We needed to establish a probe for the research and also to build towards an actual outcome for our partners. Seeing what happens by putting something out there is a valuable approach for research in that it can open up new questions for investigation. And that's what it did for us. 
from the pilot study, we moved on to try to understand more some of the social dynamics that emerged in the online community. And finally, we studied the underlying incentives for usage and what factors inside and outside of the system contribute to its ongoing use. All along the way, this work has been a balancing act of trying to further our understanding of how social software should be adapted for different social, cultural, and economic contexts, but also meeting concrete practical objectives of a project accountable to an NGO and its funders. So this was a difficult but ultimately rewarding challenge. So with that said, where are we going next? Uh, this work will move forward in several directions. First, smartphones in India are approaching $100 and mobile internet users are set to jump from an estimated 25 million in 2012 to 50 million in 2014. So we'll be looking at how to take advantage of the more powerful computing, data access, and graphics capabilities for, of smartphones for richer user interaction. Sorry. Um, speech recognition currently works with high accuracy on a large vocabulary for only a small handful of the world's languages but active research in techniques for low resource languages will likely change that. So integrating speech to text into the platform will be increasingly critical as well as the amount of content grows and people demand better ways to access specific content. The second direction um, has to do with applying the technology in, uh, in a broader context. We've applied it so far in a limited context with one NGO in a single domain. But group exchange of voice content has general applicability, and we want to understand how it applies more broadly. Toward that end, we've recently started a company in India called Awaz Day, which means give your voice. So Awaz Day will continue the, this project and expand it by working with organizations all over India to help communities connect and exchange information through voice-based social media. For example, after we deployed Avadrotlo with DSC, we partnered with Labor Voices to apply voice-based social media to bringing transparency to migrant labor in India. Next, we partnered with Sesame Workshop in India to set up a system to connect village school teachers and to create an audio repository of educational games and activities. With Jatan Trust, we've created a voice classifieds line to uh, provide a market linkage between small-scale organic farmers and local Indian organic retailers. Now these are just to name a few of the applications we're working on in domains ranging from agriculture to women's empowerment. And finally, in the future, we want to understand what impact voice-based social media has on people's everyday lives. So in the case of Avadrodlo, for example, is it helping farmers become more informed? Are they more connected to other farmers? Are they making better farming decisions? And ultimately, are they improving their livelihoods? Currently, we're working with a team of economists to run a randomized field trial of Avadrotlo to answer some of these questions. But the impact of this work shows up from time to time in smaller, less measurable ways. And the pleasure I get from this work comes through hearing these stories and testimonials of individual farmers who have benefited from the service. So I want to play one of these testimonials for you now. The recording you're about to hear was made by a farmer who had asked a question on Avadrotlo about planting millet crop. A day or so after posting his question, the system called this phone with a response from one of DSC's experts. So the farmer got this call with a response, and after hearing it, he recorded a follow-up response to that response. So this is what he said. So the Gujarati speakers in the audience got that. I mean, what sticks out about this recording is that the farmer spends the first 30 seconds giving thanks and praise for the system, and then the final part, asking a serious technical question about agriculture. To me, this represents the potential for what the system can be, both a source for human connection in the building up of social capital 
and a source for high quality information and built up knowledge capital. Now the thank yous. I want to thank uh, first my committee uh, for all of their help and guidance. Uh, thank you to our great group of funders and collaborators on this project, Stanford School of Engineering, the Palmy Group, uh, Nokia Research, of course our partner on the ground, uh, DSC, IBM Research in India, and the Berkeley School of Information. I want to thank the two best advisors in the world. Uh, first, Scott Clemmer. Scott, I want to thank you for both giving me the space and support I needed to do this work and also challenging me intellectually throughout the process. I feel very fortunate to have just been around you all these years, observing how you think and uh, approaching problems. It's really helped me grow intellectually. Thank you for that. And to my other advisor, Thupin Freak, Tap knows this, but uh, you know, he's the reason I decided to go to grad school in the first place and a big reason why I made it this far and I'm standing in front of all of you today. Um, Tap, I want to thank you, of course, for your ideas and practical know-how for this project, but also especially for really instilling confidence in me to carry this work through. And I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. I want to thank my mom, dad, and brother, who are silent collaborators in everything that I do. Um, Thanks to all of my friends and family, both in California and in India, who have made me feel at home in both places. This work is dedicated to the farmers of Gujarat, and I want to thank them for all of the love that they've shown me throughout the years. And finally, you can access all the materials related to this work, uh, including links to our open source software at this URL. And with that, I thank you for your attention. say a bit more about the nature of the response measure and how much insight that gives us into this distinction that you saw. So in particular, one thing that occurred to me is that there might be multiple ways in which people are evaluating responses in the system. So just as an off-the-cuff hypothesis, and there might be a difference between the utility of the information, that how would I use that in my farming practice, and how much do I trust it. So for example, I might be more likely to engage with the system and follow up if I don't trust something. Mm -hmm. And so how do those issues maybe affect your results and how might we you know, get more insight into this interesting mm -hmm. sort of distinction in future work? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So I think you know, the, the follow-up uh, follow phone call as a behavioral measure could potentially be uh, due to many things, not just how influenced they are by uh, the particular information that was presented. Uh, we did ask people after um, the study, you know, when they uh, got the phone call, and they got the number to ask and follow up, uh, what, what was their decision process in deciding whether they would follow up or not? And the majority did say that uh, they were deciding whether that information was useful to them or not. So we had you know, a number of tips that had to do with, for example, cotton crop. And there was a number of farmers in the study who didn't um, farm cotton. So you know, they clearly said that I'm not going to follow up because I don't, it doesn't matter to me. We got very few responses that, see, that indicated um, or that suggested that perhaps they were looking at it as, am I, do I trust this information or not? Although I think that's a valid uh, possibility. I mean, that's something that would have to be checked in follow-up work. Thank you, Neil, for such a great presentation. You mentioned the contents uh, acquisition of all the data that is uh, acquired by the, your system. Uh, the question is, there is uh, misinformation, misinformation, uh, totally garbage information, and collectively good information. How would you filter these things out when there is coming in from different sources such as the peer 
uh, 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 farmers or the authority uh, figures that is uh, uh, collecting all this data. Mm -hmm. So that was the main concern, one of the main concerns of the uh, of DSC, the NGO, when we did the pilot, because there was no real way to control what went on the system and what didn't during the pilot period. So the, one of the first things they said was, for us to carry this project forward, we have to have more control or uh, better ways to be able to uh, control that content. It's, it's especially important with a voice medium because you cannot uh, listen to more than one thing at a time, well at least. Whereas with a text uh, forum, for example, you could browse a lot of text at one time. So filtering out and making sure that the content that you're listening to, especially the first or second message even, uh, uh, would be high quality, that's really important. So that's where we, uh, why we decided to develop these tools for moderation and, and administration on, the, on, a, on a web, on the browser interface, so that that would be an easy task for somebody to do on a regular basis. The, the listener, there's a two sides to this. One is the collection of the data, and the one is the, the listening, uh, uh, content listeners. Now, the content listeners, how would they uh, look at uh, call the numbers and, and the information they are extracting out of that can be useful for what they are ex exactly out of this, all this misinformation, disinformation, all this collective information. How would they really trust that kind of information? Uh, so how would they trust it? You know, that, so I, I think there's two questions there. One is, uh, when you call in, how do you know what content is useful to you? And the second is, how do you trust that, that content? So for the first question, I think, you know, and we're, we're starting to do this uh, through some of the manual tagging and so on that we've done, what would, be, uh, would make the sort of browsing easier is if you were, you were able to, for example, listen to particular messages by a particular topic. And so that's something that we're going to be building in. Whenever you, whenever you add more complexity to the voice interface, though, you'll, uh, you have to be careful because that sacrifices simplicity of the system. So uh, you know, any kind of filtering or submenuing that you would do by you know, creating a, a separate section for particular crops or topics, that would require navigating more. So there's a trade-off there. In terms of the trust, you know, I kind of uh, got at one of the suggestions or one of the ideas in uh, making this, the, the system have more of a sense for, or give people more of a sense for what is good information or not, one, one idea is a reputation system where uh, a person can listen to content or before even hearing the content, have some kind of indication for who this person is. Can, have they answered questions in the system before? Does the NGO uh, endorse this person? To what extent? So some sort of way of uh, reflecting the, the level of uh, trustworthiness of the system within the system, of the person within the system, would definitely be helpful. I, uh, just sort of a follow-up to the first of those two questions. I'm curious if you looked into any sort of mechanism for, because I'm assuming each person's calling from a personal, their personal phone, uh, and you can then, when they call back, know that it's them. Did you look at any sort of system for setting up an account with, that's customized for that person and what they're interested in? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, and that's, I guess, getting at the other, uh, another sort of strategy of making sure that content that people listen to is uh, of relevance to them. So what we can do is, you know, if people are consistently calling over a single phone number um, and, even, and, and they're asking <laughs> questions, as we are uh, categorizing those questions, we get a sense for what those people are interested in knowing about. And so when we do these sorts of broadcast callings, or uh, other kinds of push information, we can tailor those, that content to what they have uh, previously either browsed or asked. Um, so that would be something that we would, uh, and we started, I've started to do that. Yes. Uh, what excites me the most about, especially about the, the latter part, uh, is that you're, uh, you're starting to reward social interaction with more social interaction. Uh, and how far, I guess, how far have you thought about pushing that in terms of, you, you mentioned things like rewarding, uh, rewarding a rating or rewarding a comment left with another call, a follow-up call. Uh, how, how far would that go? I mean, uh, how, how many different things have you thought about rewarding those calls with? And have you also thought about when they, when they do get a reward, 
how are they notified of that? Do they get a badge? Is mm -hmm. there some kind of gamification that you're working in mm -hmm. or thinking about in the, in the next iteration? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we, this is all next iteration stuff. We haven't um, put anything out there in terms of, uh, uh, you know, rewards for different types of social behavior. But, you know, we have thought about it uh, some. And, um, yeah, so I think there's going to be, there's going to have to be two things. One is the actual game mechanics of, uh, you know, what are the rules and how are those rules actually even made clear to people. And also, how do people know what their score is? You know, uh, how, many, how many free calls do they have and, and so on and so forth, depending on the scheme. Um, so all of these things are made quite difficult because if you're only assuming a phone interface, um, you know, it's difficult to sort of bubble up some of these inf this information. One idea is to leverage SMS in, in certain ways, in, in, you know, for example, checking a balance um, and uh, using that as a sort of multimodal way of kind of playing these game mechanics. Yes? I was, I was wondering how much, what's the cost of setting up this entire system as such? Um, so um, the software is, uh, is an open source project, so there's no cost to that. Uh, what it requires basically is the server infrastructure um, in the local area that you want to put the system in. Um, so for example, for us, we have an office in India with a bunch of servers. They're connected to special phone lines that we get from the phone company there that allow multiple simultaneous calls. In theory, you could set this up over, you know, using a SIM card if you wanted to, but that gives you limited functionality because there's only one person that can call in at, a, at the same time. Um, but it's basically the cost of a commodity server um, the most expensive part of it is the hardware that you use to interact with, that you use to interface with the phone line. But if it's a simple, you know, GSM modem, then that's also, you know, a hundred bucks or less. Um, but uh, the, the big cost is the airtime. So depending on how you set the lineup, whether you're paying for it as a toll-free number or uh, you're having people pay part of it by calling in, um, that's the cost that increases or stays uh, constant over time. That's the that's the cost that ends up being the big consideration. So, what would be the estimate for like a group of villages, say, like for your study? As well, again, it depends on how much they call. So, we you know we have uh, several different uh, applications currently, mm -hmm. and the call frequency is pretty wide ranging. You know, some some systems get tens of calls a day. Some systems get hundreds of calls a day. And then if you figure about a rupee per minute, you know, then you can do the math uh, back of the envelope. Um, but it, it really depends on how many people are calling and how much they're calling. And of course, the, the trade-off or the sort of the proportion of sharing between who pays um, also is determined by how you set the lineup. Yes. Neil, uh, this is a broad question. I think uh, you've done excellent work. We are sort of now talking to several groups in India where the basic question asked is who is doing an honest research for the bottom of the pyramid? I have not come across any group in India who truly worked for the bottom of the pyramid. Everybody works for their own cause, whatever the cause is, but the bottom of the pyramid is, gets totally neglected. Well, uh, I'm not sure I would agree with that completely. I think there's a lot of people doing uh, really, really excellent work, as, as, at least what I've come across. Um, I could mention, uh, you know, of course, all of the partners that we're working with, I think, do really outstanding work. Uh, one in particular I would uh, draw your attention to is Digital Green, um, which has been around for quite a while. It was a project that was spun off by Microsoft Research. And they're trying to use video um, as a medium for uh, agricultural practice dissemination. And I would consider them to be doing really high quality work trying to uh, make information technology, leverage information technology in a very practical way, also in a very cost effective way. So they de developed this model where uh, it actually, you know, at least partially pays for itself, but also is uh, definitely creating a social good. So I, I, I would definitely say that there are um, projects out there that are doing good work. And I think there's, uh, you know, the future is, um, is quite bright. I think there's a lot of projects that, that have the potential. Seva Group in Ahmedabad, this is the Women's Association. They're looking for the most efficient cooking device. This is fundamental to their daily life. Lawrence Berkeley Lab spent a lot of time and money to come up with an answer. 
even as of today, they still don't have a device that will work for the woman in the village to cook what they want to cook. I mean, it's a simple thing. And they call hundreds of vendors to sell them the device. It does not solve the problem that the, the village woman has. So this is where I see a big gap. I think uh, I'll talk to you more later. Questions? Uh, it's Neil again. Uh, 